I served as an armourer from uh, 1997 to 2013. I uh, joined the Air Force in 1975, late 75. I served from 86 to 98. I served from 1954 to 1985. I joined the RAF in 1961. I spent 25 years in the Air Force. So I signed on for three, but I stayed for 38 years. Um, I became uh, involved in my first operational, real operational flying, when the Falklands conflict came into play in around about uh, 1982. There was always a threat. If you're going into a conflict area, um, you've got ships down there that can fire missiles against you. You've got aircraft that can come off the Argentinian mainland. Um, you've got missile systems on the Falkland Islands themselves. Many of the missions that went all the way down towards the Falklands um, were probably the ones that were um, the most unclenching, I should say. Uh, and the, the concept was we, we did a lot of intelligence work. Yeah, we were, when we weren't flying, we were heading the books and reading into all the defence intelligence information that we could get on many of these, um, these assets that the Argentinians operated. So we were very conscious that when we were going down there, we were going to have to be keeping our eyes very clearly open on the sensors to stay away. So you do two things. You use your radar to keep you safe and you operate in the vicinity of, um, of friendly assets. So once the carriers got down into the, uh, into the environment, then it was always useful to, um, to know that the, there might be a sea harrier on your tail if you need them. Uh, and that was sort of one of the things that you actually used to take account of. And uh, unfortunately, none of us actually were, you know, were prosecuted by them. So it turned out to be a safe environment for the Nimrod fleet, at least, but not for very many of our colleagues in the Army and the, uh, and the Navy, of course. When you fly, you sort of know it's, um, it's not risk-free. Um, and as much self-protection or, you know, sort of safety protection you can put on an aeroplane as you like, um, eventually you've got to, you, it's still got to be able to fly and carry fuel and carry weapons. So there's always going to be a chance that something will go wrong. Um, obviously we try our hardest to avoid all those situations. But I've, I've seen a number of situations. There's an aircraft lost in a flying display, uh, pilot error. There's an aircraft um, that um, took off from Kinloss and landed straight into um, the forest ahead of it and uh, the, both pilots were killed. Uh, that was my own squadron. Um, and um, so there's, you know, these things do happen. Um, incredibly sad. Um, it's part of part of what happens. You know, um, it doesn't happen as much in the likes of the big maritime patrol aircraft world as it does in the fast jet world, where yeah, life is even more dangerous. But I'm pretty sure those guys will feel pretty much the same. Well, I went to Aden um, close to the end of its of a, a military base in 1967, in February 1967. Um, the place was in turmoil because the locals all wanted rid of us. Uh, so it was a very unpleasant tour in 1967. The last few months in Aden were, were awful. We were absolutely awful. We kept moving down closer to the runway and they closed areas behind it, kept it protected um, because we were constantly under attack from local terrorist groups. They all wore the same clothing very difficult to know whether you were safe or not. The weapon of choice from the, from the terrorists was a grenade. Uh, you have no sort of uh, chance of finding who's thrown it. They, they get in a little group, somebody would lob a grenade at you. It was pretty, uh, pretty frightening place to be at times. But on one particular day, the, the, the really bad day in 1967, which caused us to go to active service, uh, there were 72 people either killed or injured in one day. 22 dead, 50 injured. I mean, that's quite something. I will honestly say that Aden was the most yeah. difficult part of my, my career by a long, long, long way. I was stationed at RAF Warrington Bomber Command. I went there in uh, 1961. Uh, and not long after I was there, the Russians started building the Berlin Wall, which heightened the tension in, in, straight away. And the 
Cold War, I think, is more pertinent to the RAF than it was to the Navy or the Army because it was the V-bombers that were the deterrent, the mutually assured destruction. So it was very different for the RAF than it was for the Army or the Navy. Um, and the Americans supplied the bombs and we supplied the Vulcan bombers. And we were on 24 hour alert and High Wycombe Bomber Command headquarters would very, very regularly uh, scramble the aircraft and we had the QRA quick reaction alert aircraft would be on the ends of the airfield in pods of three and um, fully loaded and the scramble would go and the crews would would literally scramble and the tension on that at, at that moment for everybody on the base life stood still because we knew that if those bombers, we didn't know whether it was an exercise from High Wycombe or whether it was the real thing. And we knew that if those bombers' wheels left the runway, it was real. And so the procedure was the aircraft would shoot down the runway as though to take off, and then Bomber Command would kill the scramble, and you'd hear the engine suddenly die. And that's what everybody waited for. You just waited tense for that moment that them engines died. Why was it so tense? Because you knew if those wheels left the runway, we were at nuclear war with Russia. And we would be the first to be hit. And, um, you, you know, I suppose, like all things, Eventually, we got a little bit more blasé about it, but it never left you. You know, you, you always had in your mind, um, you don't want them wheels to leave the runway. <laughs> and no matter what you did on that base, you could have been a cook or a wing commander. You all had that same emotion, you know. And, and of course, the Americans, they were with us. I was involved with the Americans because we used to guard the SSA, which is the supplementary storage area where the nuclear bombs were, 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 were stored. And so there was massive security there. And so the RAF police and the United States Air Force police, we were jointly responsible for the security of those bombs. Um, I must be one of the few people in the world that actually fell asleep on a 10 megaton nuclear bomb. <laughs> and then <t> and <laughs> and then was told, well, of course, you know, it make you sterile. <laughs> people got used to it in the end. They used to say, oh, another false alarm, you know, this sort of thing. And then they'd go, uh, because it could be an attack. You know, it was, uh, it was always there and it was always at the back of your mind. But after a while, I think, I, I, I mean, I, for instance, what we were doing uh, uh, during the Cold War itself was at Goodersloe, really. That was the main place that, that I remember about the Cold War. And we were chasing Russians around. Uh, they were in, the, they call it a Soxmiss. Uh, it was the Soviet um, uh, mission to uh, our side, you know, wherever in Germany. And we had similar going to the Russian side, you know, of, of East Germany. And uh, what we had to do was follow these Russians and make sure that they weren't taking photographs of various installations. It's difficult to explain, really. The Russians had old, beat up old cars, but they had super, super, super engines in them and they could go, you know, very, very fast. And they always tried to lose, they knew we were following them and they used to try and lose us. And then we'd chase them all over the country. It was, it was uh, very strange, very odd. But um, we, we were issued with um, American Ford Fairline uh, motor cars that were souped up as well. 
so that we could follow them. But they, you knew who they were. They had a sign on the back of the car. They had to have a sign saying Socksmith's mission to, you know. Was it dangerous following these? So oh, they, yeah. Who were these Russians? Were they? Well, they were Russians. They were Russians. Uh, presumably, they were... Um, they were Russian military. We didn't know much about it, but we had to keep them away. And sometimes we'd get a bit near. There was dodging, you know, moving around and pointing at them and saying, get off and all this sort of thing. At the time, we'd, you were young. You didn't worry about things like that. I mean... <laughs> Having spent nearly two years at Valley, I was... I'm trying to think of the right word. I volunteered, I volunteered to go to Northern Ireland. And all of the skills that I'd acquired from Witten and from Valley, I thought would be invaluable in Northern Ireland because at the times it was still a troubled place. It was still dangerous for people. And I thought that volunteering to go there would give me the best opportunity to practice everything that I'd learned out supporting the regiment, the British Army on the ground to do what the British government wanted us to do. So three years Northern Ireland, here we come. It was unique because the IRA will shoot at your helicopter when you're out there, whether you're helping the Irish populace who are injured at roadside and need a medic or whether you're looking after the military personnel. You're a target, you're in a big green helicopter. Three squadron were the in the in battalion the in squadron for ground defence of RAF Aldergrove and RAF Bishop's Court, and they did ground patrols. And you would go out with them as the medic in a in a brick, as they called it. Didn't mean much to me because I'm not a regiment, you know, but there's eight other lads and you, four in each van, off you go out and patrol in the local area. If anything goes wrong, this is what you could face. This is way what you could be called upon to do. And as a medic, if the regiment are under attack and they need you to treat them, you need to be able to A, defend yourself and B, look after them. And I'm sorry, I probably didn't say before. So a medic under the Geneva Convention is a non-combatant role. You're not meant to be armed. But what a lot of people don't realise is actually, as a medic, you can carry a personal protection weapon. So nine times out of ten, I'd have a pistol. The rest of them would have a lot, a lot more, but I'd have a pistol to protect myself and the patient should we come under attack. If we had to send patients to civilian hospitals, we would make sure that nobody was going to the same hospital on the same day, that people didn't have consecutive hospital appointments, that if they went, we tried to send them different routes. You know, there's only so many hospitals and there's only so many ways you can get there but you still have to vary your route, you still have to try and make it different so that people aren't able to target you and you possibly become a victim of terrorism. And that's how it works out there. For, for good or for bad, I decided to get married while I was in Northern Ireland. So my partner joined me out there, had to learn the life as I had. It wasn't quite as intense because there was a lot of socials for families on the base. But again, she knew how to check a car. She knew how to be vigilant. She knew about the routes. She's not quite as adept at map reading, etc., as I am or going different ways. But when you're out together, you work it and you look after each other and you become almost your own security team. I deployed out um, in the May came home in the October, November of uh, 2008. I was based at um, Kandahar. Um, I was actually based on the Hercules fleet, that was where my office was. Um, but we were responsible for the aircraft on 1310 flight, which was the Hercules uh, and the Chinooks. Um, I worked with four squadron RAF and the Naval Strike Wing, they were the two Harrier squadrons out there at the time. And I also worked with which was the Special Forces um, aviation flight, both their Chinooks and their Hercules. All of the repatriations were done through the British Herc line and by the RAF, regardless of nation. So that was 
um, at the time that was we had uh, Danes, Dutch, Americans, Romanians, um, British obviously um, and so it wasn't just a repatriation that's why we were doing more we'd probably do two or three a week potentially um, not all the time but we we definitely had periods where you know because everyone was operating in different places and even if these guys were coming up from Bastion this could have been US Marines or um, whatever coming up from Bastion um, and part of the ground crew had to be one of the weapons engineers so you had to be part of the ceremony you had to be there as a safety person and, and all of you know all of the jobs that you would normally do um, but because it was more ceremonial or as you had to be a part of that you couldn't just be there um, and so what we you know originally we said right okay we'll do one you know we'll just rotate um, but most of my guys that were working with me were like 18 19 um, and I could just see after a few weeks that it was really starting to affect them just seeing coffins every and it wasn't always one you know sometimes we were putting three or four on the back of an aircraft they were all young lads so I decided I would do all of them um, to make sure that they carried on doing what they needed to do for me and for the you know for the deployment so um, but I think it definitely took its toll <laughs> ultimately I mean I was in my late 30s then and they were my guys at the end of the day they were so yeah but I did that for probably four months which is a lot of bodies I put back on aircraft. I haven't really talked about that for a long time, to be fair. So, but I know I, I, that, yeah, I did all of that. Um, and I know uh, the warrant officer that was in charge of it, because he was actually from Halton, was a really good friend of mine. Um, well, actually, there was two. It was the the, the SWO from Holton was running it, um, and uh, it affected him pretty badly. Everyone came back through there. Um, we were also dealing with a lot of the Kazakh type stuff. Um, I didn't realise that you could back a Herc up under the back uh, under the tail end of a C seventeen, um, but you can <laughs> um, because we were, were told. Um, one night, um, that they were, sorry, uh, that they were, they've been working on guys, um, in the Chinooks, uh, carried on. They got onto Bastion, um, straight onto a Herc. Um, we're working on them all the way back. Um, but these were, this was stuff that couldn't wait till they got to the QE. Um, <coughs> so they'd set up a C-17 um, uh, with a Harrier actually in the front of it, um, broken down going back to the UK um, and then um, for full operating theatres. <sighs> really haven't spoken about a lot of this for a long time. <coughs> and, um, yeah, they came in, I don't know, it's like three o'clock in the morning and you can literally back a herc up under the tail of a C-17 and we all moved them while the medics were still working. straight from one to the other. And then straight into proper theatre. Once they were in the air, they were in, they were in theatre, effectively. So I was very proud of that, that we were part of that process of getting the guys, injured guys from the battlefield back to the QE and made it absolutely seamless. And when I do say seamless, I meant they were being worked on from the second they left the battlefield to the time that they were in a hospital bed in the QE. Whilst I was in Gan, um, the station commander called for me one day and he said, uh, 
I want you to uh, do a special operation that we've got come straight from the Ministry of Defence. I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, right, he said, uh, you'll be leaving tonight on a, a Britannia. Uh, you'll be in charge of security on this aircraft. You're flying into Entebbe. And uh, when you get to Entebbe, we got to lift out a lot of the British uh, armed force, um, army that's um, been kicked out by Idi Amin. So uh, we flew to, um, we were supposed to go into Kenya, or Kenya as they call it now, um, to refuel, but uh, we couldn't do that. Um, so we went straight on to Entebbe, uh, picked up all these people, the colonel said, uh, can I use the microphone? And uh, when we got in the air, when we landed, they all came on, on board with the, with the uh, machine guns and, and uh, so on and so forth. I said to the, um, the air load, ma not the air load, ma the uh, engineer, air engineer, I said, I want you to, they wouldn't let us off the aircraft at first. And I said, you've got to get off. I said, because you've got to check the aircraft. You've got to check it for, Limpet mine, or whatever they call them, I don't know. They used to stick things on aircraft. He said, if we can't get off, we can't uh, be sure that it's quite safe and uh, to take off with all these families on. So uh, he said, okay. And I said to the pilots, I said, we don't, we don't know where we're going, actually. You know, we, we've landed here. We've got to wait for the Ministry of Defence to tell us where to go. So you better go when you soon this, that they tell us where we've got to go to get refueled, um, you, you've got to go and get some charts. So you can get off the aircraft and go to the place where they get the maps and charts and things. So uh, that, that all transpired very well. And uh, we got, um, we had to, we couldn't go to, uh, to Kenya for some reason, I don't know what it was. And we finished up at the islands in the Indian Ocean where people go on holiday again, not the Maldives, the other place, I can't think what it's called now. The Seychelles? That's it. So we finished up at the Seychelles and stayed in the uh, Rock Hotel overnight. And uh, had a great time there, <laughs> refueled. And then instead of, instead of going back to Gan, which was what we were supposed to do, take these people off the Britannia, put them on a VC-10 back to the UK. Well, no, no, Ministry of Defence said, no, you've got to stay, you've got to come back to the UK. But first of all, you've got to Mazira. And then uh, once you've been to Mazira, you go into Akrotiri, and then you come back to Bryce Norton. Well, there's me, uh, the, the, the only person really that uh, was from GAN, the other people were all to do with the aircraft, the pilots and uh, the engineer and so on. So I finished up at Bryce Norton eventually after going to Mazira, Akrotiri and everything, and all these people. And so I was the head, head waiter on the aircraft, helping these ladies and that, with giving them tea and that. There's nobody else, you see, to do it. And um, the co-pilot helped as well, uh, and, uh, and the engineer. And uh, we finished up at Bryce Norton, and when I got there, there was a lady movements officer. Uh, she said, uh, what are you doing here? I'm in shorts, you know. It's bloody freezing October it was. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, I explained what had happened. And then she said, well, uh, what are we going to do with you? I said, well, what? I've got to get back to Gan. Oh, she said. Uh, so if after about half an hour of discussions with people on the station at Prize, she said, uh, you've got to uh, go home now. You can go home for a week and then we'll get you back to Gan. I waited a week and nothing, nothing, nothing. So I thought I'd better ring records office and see what's going on. So I spoke to him and he said, uh, well, we've got nothing. Uh, I explained what had happened. And he said, well, we don't know anything about this. He said, you, except that uh, we think you might be declared absent without leave. So, <laughs> so he said, it's okay. He said, we'll sort it out. And, and eventually they gave me a ticket back and I got back to Bryce and on a VC-10 and back to Gan. And that was it really with that one. It's a big desert as you're aware, Sahara Desert. And in those days, there was no 
GPS. Everything was dead reckoning in the desert. And um, if you had somebody in trouble, um, and mostly you used to get the odd, odd civilian tourists, mainly French, I remember, particularly in Benghazi area. But there was no formal desert rescue team. So the El Adam base had a volunteer one, a bit like the RNLI. And um, we had X military vehicles. I remember we had some old Austin one tonners, four wheel drive and some Bedfords and Land Rovers and they were all painted white. Um, and if, if they were in range, they would go out and search for anybody that had got lost in the desert or was missing or if an aircraft went down. And uh, those vehicles were always stationed opposite the guard room, oddly enough. Uh, and lined up and ready to go and all the lads on the station were the crews. Um, so uh, the only backup they had, air backup, and as I said they, they would be working on dead reckoning. Um, and the only air backup we had, we had three sycamore helicopters, that's going back a bit, they had, I remember they had wooden rotors. And I think they were on detachment from 38 Squadron in Singapore, I think. Um, and they were the only air support that we had for the, the, the rescue. It was there if it was necessary. Um, there was nothing that the Libyans provided, you see. There was no military support for people lost in the desert or anything like that. Another time while I was there, um, there's a town further up towards Tripletania called Barchi, and they had quite a severe earthquake. And um, <clears throat> we felt the tremor in the night. It, was in the, it happened in the night. And um, the next day, um, a rescue team went up to see what, what had happened. And I understand that some, over the next few hours, some Beverly's came from Cyprus, from Blackburn Beverly's, um, supplied tents and blankets and so forth. And I went into the town uh, quite a few days afterwards and it was devastated. And the times I've heard similar stories to this, which you never understand, but there was a tower, a clock tower in there, and it was the only building left standing. And everything else had gone, but this one tower stood there with the clock. I'll never forget that. And, um, and the other thing I don't think I'll ever forget was the smell. You know, it's just awful, because people were buried, I guess. Well, I was only there um, very briefly because the blankets and the tents that had been brought from Cyprus were being stolen. And uh, they were, many of them were found in the souks. So that's, that's why the police were involved up there. And we also, at RAF Witten, did uh, what they called Mid-Anglia Anglia General Practitioners Ag accident service, MAGPASS. And we therefore supported the local doctors and ambulance service to cover crashes and accidents and incidents on the local roads. So suddenly as an LAC with 16 weeks experience and six weeks at Swinderby, you could be in an ambulance going out to a road traffic accident, to an overdose, to all sorts of bits and pieces. And again, the learning curve was steep, scary, but it was also enjoyable. I reveled in it because this is what I joined up to do. This was what I expected a medic to be. And while you're sat in an office filing papers in the morning, if an aircraft has an emergency on the airfield, you're suddenly in the back of an ambulance going out and looking at what's going on and the potential. We had Nimrods there, we had cameras, so there was anything from two to a dozen aircrew who could suddenly be depending on you for life-saving first aid. And yeah, it was scary, but again, 
I look back on it with a great affection because it was a real learning curve and a really enjoyable one because I was lucky to have good warrant officers, flight sergeants, sergeants and corporals around me who would teach you, would work with you, would help you understand where you were going right and wrong. My posting after RAF Witten was to RAF Valley and I couldn't have been happier because RAF Valley, yet again, did a crash cover on the local roads. They had the search and rescue there, they had the mountain rescue team and it was a really active flying station because all the baby pilots went there as we called them, which is probably not what we're allowed to call them now, but that's how we referred to them, the baby pilots. And it was brilliant, you know, move, it, it was a, a step in the right direction for me because I was expanding my remit as a medic and learning more. When, when search and rescue was as it was when I was there, it was military, 22 squadron, yellow bellies out on a Wessex. You could be thrown on the back as the medic and be going out to a ship in distress, uh, climbers on the hills in Snowden, anything that they needed you for, you were there. The winchmen were excellent, really well trained, but occasionally it was outside their remit and you as the medic would be put in with them and you would be sat in the back of a helicopter Wherever they went, you went. If they said you're going on decks and are treating with a patient with the winchman, that's where you were and that's what you did. And if you were coming back up with them, that was it. You had to. In, uh, in 1967, the, they were all unaccompanied tours. The, the families were not allowed to go there. The place was becoming more and more dangerous every, every day almost. And come the middle of 1967, the families that were there, people who'd been uh, the previous two years, we'll say, they were all evacuated out. All the families, wives, children, everybody like that was evacuated out because we couldn't keep them safe. And of course, uh, the problem with an unaccompanied tour in those days, you had to find somewhere for your wife to live. She couldn't stay in the married quarter you had at Lynham. She had to go and find somewhere else. So I had to find a, a surplus married quarter and she ended up in Wilmslow, uh, just near Manchester. Um, she was very unhappy um, about me being away and it caused a lot of problems for uh, a lot of people. I was fortunate, I, I managed to keep a marriage, but lots of people lost their marriage because of uh, unaccompanied tours. It was 12 months, you know, it wasn't um, a short term thing, it was 12 months, you were away for 12 months. It, mar marriage problems, uh, friends who got Dear John type letters, you know, they were devastated. Blueies, they were called. Yeah. Letter was the only means of communication, of course, I mean, completely different than things today, but uh, the letter was the most important thing you could have. A letter from home was important. The ladies' part of Aden was fairly scarce, to say the least. There was 4,000 troops and 40 WAFs. So, the chances of uh, courting anybody were fairly remote. I think the, one of the best days was when I took my wife to Miss Britain in Libya. Anne had never been out of Europe and she went, she flew to Cairo and then to Benina in Benghazi. And we, and a friend of mine, Taff Thickpenny, um, we drove from Tobruk in a, in a Land Rover and we, we picked her up and we stayed a couple of days in Benghazi. And then, as I say, she's never been out of Europe. And instead of driving her on the North African road, which is tarmac, we took her 300 miles straight across the Zahara Desert. <laughs> and uh, that was an experience for her and she loved it and I, I was worried it was a bit too much but she, and the, the day we left there I think it's my biggest memory so it's not really military but it was taken across and we we drove through villages and little wadis and sort you know all the local Arabs and then we eventually got to Miss Britain and stayed the night there and she fed us on honey and eggs and, and unleavened bread and, and had a shower. But that, that's my, and I've got photos of that visit. And that, that's my biggest memory, I think, of just making it such a lovely 
experience for her. Because I don't think many European ladies would have done that. <laughs> it, what, she was a bit frightened because, of course, we were armed. <laughs> we had to be armed to go out. <laughs> so, there we were, you know. She, she, I suppose she had these fantasies of being attacked by marauding um, natives or something. Yeah, that's, that's my memory. Do your kids remember, um, you know, quite young or whatever, do, do they remember that period of time? They do, and it, the, the effect it definitely had on them. Um, and when I got back from Afghanistan, I was posted immediately to Odium, so I was going to be going back more regularly. Um, and the effect it definitely had on them was if they saw my, um, my Bergen in the hall or if they saw my body armour or anything, they immediately kind of went into a bit of a flat spin because they just figured I'd be going away again. Because they'd never really had that. Um, I'd only been going away um, previous to Cosmore, I was at Stafford. Um, so I did do some work with TSW, um, but it was never away for more than a few days, week, um, you know, stuff like that. But with the Afghanistan thing, they kind of knew body armour and helmets and holsters and all, all the other stuff came along with the territory. So then when we got to Odium, every time they saw body armour or helmets in the hall, they all kind of went into a bit of a flat spin over, so you're going away for six months again. And um, But actually that's why I put in to go to Odium, because the Chinook guys were only doing six weeks at a time. You went more often, but you didn't go, you were doing it short, regular bursts, which is what um, Odium were doing and Lynham were doing at the time. No, you just accepted it. It was a, a way of life. The, the, to me, the service was a way of life, and my wife was my wife was a, a daughter of an army officer, so she knew what it was about up to a point because he died very young. He, he, uh, but um, she, they moved around a lot and lived in married quarters and that, so she knew. So she, she, she's home now. She, she saw me out the gate and said, "Get on." You were in the Air Force. The Air Force said, you go there, you went. That was it. You didn't argue about it. Oh, I did, I did when I went to Aden. I said, could I have a deferment? I want to go to Aden. I'm not trying to get out of it, but could I have a deferment of three months? Because my wife's expecting a baby and she's due to, you know, to have it at any time. And that's what happened. So I waited th two or three months and then I went to Aden. And I went unaccompanied at first, as I said earlier, because uh, it was an unaccompanied tour unless you could sort out accommodation for yourself. You couldn't get married quarters, although there were married quarters, but there were so many people in the Air Force and it was a point system. And if you were a young man, you didn't have the points that the older ones had that had been in the service a lot longer. So they used to get the married quarters. That was difficult at first, but as soon as I got to Aden, I found out that if you could get your place, you could get your wife out. And it took me a couple of months, two or three months. And um, did you spend a lot of time away from the family? Uh, not really, but I had periods of it, like three months in, in North Africa, four months in Cyprus, you know, so on, periods like that. But when you condense that into 30 years, that's not a lot. I, the, the Maldives was the longest one I had, I think, a year, a year there. But then again, I got, I got to break it home in the middle of it, you know, which you didn't get normally. Big thing was um, you couldn't get married quarters. When I needed them, I couldn't get married quarters. And uh, two or three times we lived in private accommodation. Uh, which they called hirings, you know. But you, you found a place and then an, uh, the RAF families officer would come down, examine it and say, yeah, that's all right, you can have that. The Air Force, you'll pay Air Force rent. The Air Force will pay the rest. Did your family come with you, with you as you were stationed around? Uh, well, some of them did because the others weren't born, you know. But um, uh, the first one did uh, to Aden. The second one was born out there. The third one was conceived in Aden and born in the RAF hospital at, um, not, uh, up near Bryce Norton, I can't remember what it's called now, the unit that used to be up there, it used to be a hospital there. 
Um, but um, when I was in Germany, uh, yes, in later years, um, they, they did, yes. When I was at Rheindahlen, I did two tours at Rheindahlen, and uh, one of my sons, uh, <laughs> he used to come down, and, uh, we were at the summer ball in the mess, and he, he's, he's going around picking up glasses. I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm getting paid for this. He says, he said, drink up. He says, I get every glass I take back, I get paid for. Things like that, silly things. Gareth Nicholas, who's obviously, uh, there's a, as you rightly say, we've, we've we very proudly named a, a road after the main street, the main sort of drag going down in the, in the station after Gareth. Um, he was a friend. Um, he was a local man. Um, and when I come to Remembrance Parade here, I always ask to come to the station. Um, and that's not because I object to going to civilian churches and things like that. But when I actually remember Gareth, I want to do it in amongst service people. Um, so I don't particularly need, feel the need to stand with a poppy on in, in a civilian environment. Um, I feel as if I want to be with the people that understand it better. Um, so that's why I do what I do. And as far as Remembrance is concerned, I don't know if you're aware, but all the graves of the service people out in Aden have all been desecrated, totally destroyed. Now, remembrance means something different to it, us yeah, it does indeed. than it does to the rest of the people. We've actually built a memorial in the, in the Cornwall at War Museum because the, there is no other memorial now to those poor souls who lost their lives and there's over 400 of them in those, in those graves. ISIS destroyed the graves of all the Christians. Just from an with a sledgehammer. So it means something different to us as ex Aiden. Yeah. When I put my medals on and my beret for parades, for remembrance services, I remember not just what I've done, but what other people have done and how their selfless sacrifice gives other people the freedom to protest against oil, protest against whatever they choose to protest against. Because without the sacrifice of those I know, they wouldn't be able to do that. And to me, that makes a massive difference. So when I stand there, when the bugle plays, yeah, I shed a tear. Yeah, I get emotionally involved. But I know that what I've done has made a difference to the people of not just the UK, but to Northern Ireland, because there's a peace process. To Bosnia, because they're a settled part of the European Union. So when you talk about remembering, yeah, I remember. Do I ever? And I've missed one Remembrance Parade since I left the service. And that was when my other half was seriously in, in hospital. And she even said, do you want to go? These young, healthy lads have been out, done their bit for Queen, for country, sorry, for King and Country now. I'm still not quite caught up. It's a year, you know, for King and Country. And their selfless sacrifice allows you to protest allows you to be irate about the price of your coffee, allows you to walk the streets not speaking German if you want to take it all the way back to remembrance. And it is massively impactful. And if you go to Horse Guards on Remembrance Sunday and see 14,000 people, all of them there to remember, it becomes real for you. I miss the service. I wish I was still in, still working, and still doing that sort of job, because I really, really enjoyed it, and that's why I stayed in the Air Force. Um, I did leave prematurely. I was 49 when I left, because uh, they kept saying to me, oh, no, stay in, you'll get your warrant and all this. And I, I said, no, no. I said, I've been offered a job in London, uh, premature voluntary release, because I was a little bit angry at the time with the Air Force, because six months before, I, I was, when, when, no, oh, I can't get the years right now. 1982 was the Falklands War, wasn't it? That's right, and this is, this is about 84 or five when I came out. Previously, when the Falklands War came on, 
I'd already PVR'd to go to um, Oman with the uh, Omani Air Force uh, as, a RAF pl as a policeman, a flight sergeant policeman. And they stopped it because of the Falklands War. And I lost the job. And I was really angry because I wanted to carry on doing police work and, and with a different air force. I mean, it was uh, really something. Because I was stopped, you know, coming out, uh, I, did fi I did finish up with Ascension Island because <laughs> uh, and that was it. But uh, now, what else? I miss the Air Force. I miss it very much. Um, I've got a friend who's 98. He lives in Plimpton. He was my first flight sergeant, and he's the man that got me onto SIB, and he's still alive. And, we, and I still keep in touch with him. And uh, after all those years, I mean, it's fantastic, really, when you think about it. And that's what I miss, is the camaraderie. So I go to the veterans' breakfast, and we've got one down at Hale. Uh, the one I go to is at Hale. And uh, I meet all like-minded like people. And um, I'm accepted in there, well thought of, you know like all the others, and we're all friends, and it's really good. That's the, the only thing I've missed now, that uh, is the Air Force. Service, okay. Um, again, it, this is a personal sort of view, not a, not a generic view. Um, to me, the, the service um, is not the classic um, king or queen and country. It's, uh, it's generally speaking, protecting the families back home and looking after the people that you're working with. So um, did I go and find, you know, and, and fly and join the Air Force because I wanted to serve Queen Elizabeth II? As much as I'm a royalist, no, I didn't. I did it because I fancied a job which was interesting and challenging. Um, and uh, I met and, um, and worked with a, a lot of fantastic people. Um, and if you gave me the option again, I'd do it all over again. Um, so much better than working for a living. Yeah, I'm just thinking, if you do five years, say, in the military, that five years has a huge amount more impact and effect on you as a person than five years in Civvy Street. That five years in the military is worth 50 years as a civilian in terms of growing, maturing, and having empathy and sympathy and so forth. You don't get that in Sibby Street. Sibby Street is uh, so disseminated. It's so split up. In the military, it's together. And uh, I still miss it. I was, de I, I was demobbed totally in 1970, for the finish, 1970, and I still miss it. <laughs> so it says something, doesn't it? I don't miss the last job I did. I don't miss the job before that. And I don't miss the job before that, but I still miss the military. And you hang on to it, I think. And I think only another military person can understand it. You can't explain it to a civilian. I try to explain sometimes to civilians that when you're listening to ex-military people, uh, sorry, or military people, um, Sometimes they get very insulting to each other. And sometimes you'll see civilians' eyebrows raised. And you can't get a civilian to understand that that insulting behavior with each other is actually a mark of its closeness. You, they can do it, but don't you try doing it from the outside. But inside, it's a mark of that devotion to each other, that cohesion that the more you insult your mate, the more he's your mate. <laughs> and it's been forever thus in the, in the military, I think. But it's difficult to explain it to outside. So I use a lot of what I learned in the military to teach them how to be good leaders, to talk to people, to question, to yeah, all of that stuff, which are uh, actually a lot of the guys that do my job with my company, there's a lot of us that are veterans. Um, I actually spent yesterday mentoring um, our newest member of staff who has just left the Air Force. Um, 
but if we give back what we learn, most of the lads, even if they've stayed civilians, um, most of the guys I've taught over the last 10 years are now managers. But actually a lot of them are going to be commissioned. One's been commissioned into the Navy, one's gone to Remy to be commissioned. Um, yeah, very, very proud of them, to be fair. You volunteer your life for Queen and Country, King and Country. Just because you haven't been to Northern Ireland, Iraq, Bosnia, Afghanistan, you signed up with the chance that you could. You volunteered. So you have given selfless service in the same way I have. Whether you've managed to do every single UK base, never go overseas. If you aren't in the UK, how can I be overseas? If you aren't manning a post in a medical centre while I'm in Bosnia, how can I be in Bosnia? Because I'd have to do your job. Every single serviceman that signs up takes that chance. Thank you.